In this video, you will hear Neville Goddard speaking about how exactly the manifestation process works and how to have faith and believe in God in order for it to work. Every conceivable situation that you could ever think of exists now as a fact in God, but cannot be made visible to you until you occupy it, for you are God's operant power. Everything in this world needs man as the agent to express it. Hate or love, joy or sorrow, all things require man to express it. We glorify or condemn the man, but he simply represents a state which God entered knowingly or unknowingly and remained there until the state was externalized. Everyone is free to choose the state he wishes to occupy. You imagined yourself into your present state. If you don't like it, you must imagine yourself out of it and into another. It is all a matter of movement. We are told in the very beginning of Genesis that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and in the book of Joshua, which is the Hebraic name for Jesus, the Lord said, Wherever the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Now you can choose where you want the sole of your foot to tread, for the world is yours and all within it. But remember, whatever you tread upon will be given to you. What Neville Goddard means when he talks about the law of assumption is that assumptions harden into fact. It's a similar and better way to say fake it till you make it, which I believe is a terrible analogy because even the phrase is telling your brain that it's fake. Assumptions hardening into fact is far better. I hope this introduction was able to make things a little clearer for you. Now let's hear Neville in his own words. Before moving on, please make sure to like our video and subscribe while are you watching. See you in the next video. With God, all things are possible. I think anyone who believes in God would say yes to that. Mm -hmm. But then we are told that God is spirit. And that the spirit of God dwells in us. I think any man who believes that would make every effort to find out who God really is, who dwells in us. His Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in us. And this God creates all things. By Him all things were made. And without it was not anything made that was made. So everything in the world, regardless of what it is, for we are told, I form the light. And I create darkness. I make the wheel. And I create the world. I am the Lord who do all these things. For surely we shall make every effort to find out who he is. I firmly believe from my own experience that this God of whom the Bible speaks is our own wonderful human imagination. That God and the human imagination are one. That all natural effects in the world, because they are created by the Spirit of God, are caused by Spirit. So every natural effect has a spiritual cause and not a natural, a natural cause only seen. It is a delusion of our fading, I would say, memory. For here, in this world, I can quite remember when I imagined that which is now taking place in my world. I do not recall it. I can't remember when I set it in motion. But if this is law, and a law that no man can break, at some time, somewhere, I imagine what I am now in country. That my present moment is not really receding into the past. It is advancing into the future to confront me. But I forgot it. And I now think it has a natural or physical cause. And it does not have a natural cause. Every natural effect has a spiritual cause. Or the Bible is completely wrong. Or we are told by him, all things were made without exception. 
and without him was not anything made that was made. And he is spirit, and the spirit of God dwells in him. Well, if he dwells in me, I have identified him with my imagination. Only on this level I do not remember, having imagined it. But along the way, I must have, if this is principle. Now, let me share with you some of my experiences. We are in this room tonight, and the room at this moment is more real to us than anything in the world. It has a cubic reality because we are in it. Think of your home. You know your home far better than you know this room. But your home at this moment is not as real as this room. This room now occupies reality to you. And everything else is shadowy as you think of it. Why is this real? Because you have entered it. You are in it. You occupy it. This I know from experience. Sitting in a chair and suddenly I am seeing what reason tells me I should not see. <clears throat> I am seeing, <clears throat> pardon me, what seems to be the interior of a hole. Or lying on my bed, I see the interior, or it seems to be, of a great hotel, an unoccupied suite, ready for occupancy, but not occupied. It was just as vivid as any painting of a great artist. An artist would give us the impression of a three-dimensional picture. We know that reason tells us it's on a flat surface. It's simply depicting three dimensions, but it is all on a flat surface. But while seated in the chair, or lying on my bed, my consciousness follows vision. And I entered that room. I actually occupied it. I came back to where I was seated on one occasion, where I was lying on my bed on another. And then I went back. And again, it took on a cubic reality. I came back knowing exactly what I am doing. I am knowing this whole thing makes no sense whatsoever to the rational mind. For I could not deny what I am experiencing. <clears throat> Here I have the evidence. No one to share it with, but I have the evidence. I came back, and I went back into the picture. And the moment I entered the picture, it took on cubic reality. And after doing it maybe a dozen or more times, I said to myself, I'm going to explore. This time, I'm going to go right into it and remain there. And explore, which I did. So I stepped into the picture. And as it closed around me, from my bed it seemed to be 30 by 20. But when I stepped into it, determined this time to keep going, regardless of consequences, it closed around me a third of what it seemed to be as I looked at it from the bed. <clears throat> so 30 by 20 became 10 by 7. I found it to be a dressing room. A dressing room with a huge, wonderful suite, ready for occupancy. No one was in it. I am the only occupant now. I came out by opening up a door. I didn't go through it. By some vapor, I actually opened the door. And to myself, I was solidly real. <laughs> Just like the man that is talking to you now. My hand could open a door. And the door was solid and it was real and I went through the door. I entered a corridor. It was a nice wide corridor, dimly lit. At the end of the corridor, intersected it, was a brilliantly lit corridor. I walked down to the very end and when I got to the end, there was this luminous, luminous, wonderful corridor. I saw two ladies coming down 
the corridor. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew how it began. It began by seeing what seemed to me just a vision, like a painting. I knew that I left my bed by consciousness following vision, and I entered the painting, and the painting took on cubic reality. I knew it, so I called that a dream. Knowing it began as a dream, I said to myself, well, it has still to be a dream. But I am dreaming now awake. I am not dreaming, sleeping. I am fully awake, but it is a dream. <clears throat> and I said to the ladies as they came by, Lady, this is all a dream. They did exactly what any nice lady would do, a stranger standing in the corridor and saying to them, this whole thing is a dream. They thought they were looking at a madman. So they got as far removed from me as they could and got right next to the wall. But the wall was as solidly real as that wall. They couldn't go through it any more than I could. And while looking at them, and they're frightened to death, they walked quickly by. And then I took, I saw something hanging like a chandelier. It reminded me of an object that I'd seen about six months before in a friend's home. And he said to me, so you can hardly tell that this thing is not suspended. If you look closely, there is an almost invisible thread that connects it to the ceiling. So I looked, and I did see that very little thin thread connecting this to the ceiling. Then I was convinced, well, it is a dream. This is a memory image of what I saw in my friend's home. So again I say to the lady, look, this must be all gossip. But as I held it, it was solidly real. <clears throat> it was just as solid as this. That surprised me. They kept on moving, and they moved rapidly towards the end. And here I am holding this thing in my hand. I took my hand off, and I said to myself, now you know it began as a dream, Neville. And there still has to be a dream. All ends run through the origin, and the origin of this experience of yours was a dream. But this must be a dream. But it is not a dream. I am just as awake as I am now talking to you, as I was talking to those ladies. When they got to the end, they looked back at this mad person in their eyes. I was mad. And they simply disappeared by stepping down two steps into what undoubtedly was the great reception room, <clears throat> the foyer, our huge big hotel. Then I say to myself, you know, how are you going to get back? How are you going to get back? There is no road leading back to that state on which you left a body, and you have unfinished business. You have a wife, and an uneducated daughter who has the ambition to go to college. And she's now only in high school. And you have left inadequate funds to take care of your obligations to your wife and daughter. You've got to get back. How to get back? I couldn't go through that door that led from that suite of rooms into the corridor and find any exit from there that is where I live in Beverly Hills. <clears throat> what on earth am I going to do? I knew, reason told me, that if I don't get back within a very short time, they'll find that body on the bed, and they will have to examine it, and they will declare it a heart attack or something. But they've got to find a physical cause for it. And here I am looking at something entirely different. It will die all right if I don't get back. And I must get back. Then I remembered a similar experience that happened years before, where feeling brought me back. Feeling awoke me in a dream. I found myself on a beach. It wasn't Barbados. It was more like the Pacific Island. I haven't been there, but I've been born in the tropics, so I know exactly what they must look like. But it was not the West Indies. It was the East Indies. And here I know I am dreaming. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I hail a physical object. 
and force myself to awake if I would awake. Well, I tried it. I held on to a pile driven into the ocean, into the beach, a solid mass of cement. As I held it, I said, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to awake right here. So I held it. And as I held it, I said, come on, awake. You know you're dreaming. And I felt myself come to, as a person comes to, when they're waking in the morning. And I, I woke. And there I am, completely awake, wading in the water and holding on to this object. 